Good. Yeah. So today we're discussing the virtuous city um, against the backdrop of this park here. So the question is, uh, what is the virtuous city? And to answer that question, we have to answer the question of who is Al-Farabi? So Al-Farabi was a, a Muslim philosopher who lived, I believe, in the 9th century AD. And he was, in my opinion, um, essentially the founder of the medieval Arab Jewish uh, peripatetic philosophers. So the peripatetic philosophers were basically um, philosophers influenced by Aristotle, and they were mostly uh, Islamic or Jewish. Uh, for the Jewish people, there was Maimonides and Gersonides, and for the Muslims, there was Al-Farabi and then Avicenna or Ibn Sina, and then some other ones like Ibn Rashid or Averroes, and uh, Al-Kindi, I think too, yeah. There were quite, quite a few Muslim ones. But Al-Farabi was probably, I, th I think he was the primary first one. Um, second in command, I hold Avicenna, and then I hold Maimonides to be pretty definitive. And those three form for me a kind of trio. So the, like, like Plato, uh, Al-Farabi came up eventually with a kind of city divided into castes or a hierarchical organization. Um, for a perfect city. And the perfect city was essentially characterized by a populace who agreed, uh, at least mentally or internally, that the purpose of life was to quote unquote know God. And uh, by God, we mean um, the eternal and unchanging uh, origin of everything that exists. Uh, so Al-Farabi's God, and also the God of the other peripatetic philosophers, cannot be known by human reason because he is too remote um, from our experience. Uh, but he is relevant to our experience through a series of intermediaries called the intelligences, um, which there are 10 in total, according to Al-Farabi. And this schema of there being 10 intelligences that emanate from the uncaused first cause is something we first find appearing in Al-Farabi's works, but um, uh, we don't know the origin of it. We, we know that it's popularized by Al-Farabi, but we don't know uh, where he got the idea, I guess, if that makes sense. But it was taken up later by Avicenna and Maimonides. So the question solved by this schema of 10 intelligences emanating is the question of how a singular, unified, non-divisible thing, that is the first cause, can give rise to multiple things. And the answer is quite clever. So. The way it works, at least the way I understand it, is very similar to Plotinus's uh, Neoplatonic emanation schema, although his is a bit more simplified, but they're both valid in the exact same way. Um, the way it works, it works at first is there's something called the one, uh, which is identical to the first cause. So this thing is unified, and it, there's no such thing as division within the being of this thing. So to create something, it first has to produce the idea of difference or distinctness. Um, and it's a bit of a meta thing, but you cannot produce distinctness. Uh, at the moment of producing distinctness, you've already created the second thing. Um, so in the act of trying to generate something, you have already generated the thing that you're trying to generate. Um, and that's how you arrive at the first intelligence. So what the one does involuntarily is produce, in order to produce in the first place, it has to produce the idea of production or difference. Uh, because prior to that act, uh, there is only unity. So there is no such thing as distinction anyways. So in the act of producing difference, um, something called the indefinite dyad comes into existence, which dyad meaning two, indefinite meaning um, uncertainty. So this this is essentially the here, this principle encapsulates the idea of distinctness. So at this point, um, all sorts of comparisons come into existence. So the second principle, AKA the first intelligence, is identical to the notion of dividing things up, uh, distinguishing between things, and then discriminating between things, um, all of which were not possible prior to the two coming to existence because there was only the one. Um, and according to the, ten, the tenfold emanation schema, uh, basically this distinct thing is able to contemplate multiple different things because he, there is distinctness now. Uh, the one cannot really contemplate itself because uh, to do so would produce a division within its, within its being. So the very act of, of contemplating itself necessitates that there must be something other than itself, and that is the thing that does the contemplation. So 
at this point, the intellect, the first intelligence, begins contemplating the one, and then it contemplates itself. So by contemplating itself, it produces something called, uh, it produces the firmament, or it produces heaven, uh, which is basically the visible sort of like uh, scaffold for all the stars and planets that we see in the sky. This is at least how Al-Farabi understood um, astronomy. And then by, produce, uh, by contemplating the one and its distinctness from the one, it produces another intelligence or another thought. Um, and that thought also contemplates itself, it contemplates its predecessor, and it contemplates the one through its predecessor. And basically, by increasingly becoming more and more multiple, these contemplations produce uh, Jupiter, uh, the stars, Saturn, and, uh, and all of these celestial entities that are purely immaterial. So these things do not actually physically exist in matter, they're just pure ideas, basically. Or identical to what you would call angels in, in pictorial religions. And the last one is the moon. Um, the moon is identical to the demiurge in Platonism because it's the thing responsible for governing the world below the moon, which is often called the sublunar world. So this is where it gets interesting. So the moon is the last immaterial thing, uh, and it's also eternal. Um, to exist in the chain of command emanating from the first cause uh, and everything below it that is the physical world of the five senses as well as the thinking mind uh, or the rational cognitive mind um, is changing and subject to death so the the condition of the human being is simply that um, we are composed partly of eternal things and partly of imperm impermanent things and our destiny is essentially to cleave to the moon, or what I will call from now on the active intellect, um, because the active intellect is the only eternal limb of God that contains within it all the ideas necessary to make a person's intelligence, quote unquote, permanent. So once you uh, successfully cleave to the active intellect, your mind actually becomes identical to the active intellect. So this is called what Al this Al Farabi called this the acquired intellect. This uh, it's based on the idea that when you come to know something successfully, your mind takes the shape of what you know, and you kind of lose your personal uh, personal um, existence, I guess, uh, in relation to what you know. So you come to know this these set of ideas which are eternal, which is the active intellect, I think, or if anyone else is more familiar with uh, the exact details. Um, you become identical to what you know, and these things are an impersonal set of principles that allow you to persist after death, basically. And for Al-Farabi, Al this was the goal of human life, because the personality, the human personality, which is identical to the thinking mind, um, and by the thinking mind, I mean the thing that performs you know, arithmetic or performs logical reasoning. So the thinking mind and the five senses, meaning the human body, like the, your fingers, your heart, uh, your eyes, these things do not persist, persist after death. They're all basically annihilated at death. Um, even if fundamental matter is never annihilated, the form which your body holds is definitely annihilated at death in the sense that it loses its cohesion. So the only way to survive death for Al-Farabi was to know the ideas because the ideas were purely intellectual and not subject to accidents of space and time. They were not circumstantial. So by knowing these kinds of knowledges, uh, you became identical to what you knew, and what you knew was eternal, so you were able to live in quote unquote forever. Um, and then, so so basically, Afarabi uh, delineated this kind of soteriology, this kind of salvational schema. Uh, but then he also began contemplating how best human beings should actually live on Earth. And Afarabi, Avicenna, and Maimonides all agreed that um, man was a political animal. This just means that the human experience for most people is not really one of living in nature. So you can go on hikes and you can walk around cities and you can look at the sun and you can think to yourself, oh, everything's great uh, because, you know, like uh, you have food and, um, you know, there's no violence around you immediately and everything's nice. But that's not really what the human experience is because uh, people cannot live independently of other people. So what the true human experience is, is essentially living in self-organized groups of human beings. So even though I live, you know, in, in nature like such, um, my true human experience is one of paying taxes and uh, working a job and, you know, um, you know, getting health insurance and socializing and adhering to cultural norms and all these types of things. And these are things are all necessary uh, because they, this is how human beings can cooperate. This is how we can provide the infrastructure 
for each other to live. So, you know, I can't farm my own food. I can't slaughter animals. I don't know how to butcher animals. Um, I can cook some things, but I can't cook everything. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to set up internet infrastructure. Um, I'm not a part of the CIA. I don't protect the borders of America. But there are other people who do all these types of things. And because they do these types of things, I can exist. So the entire idea of a society is ultimately a social one. So the human experience is a social one because we don't experience raw nature. Um, to a certain extent, animals experience raw nature, um, especially if they're more divested from groups, but even animals form groups. But to, to, a, to a more than human degree, animals uh, experience nature directly but humans don't. Uh, the world we experience is a social one. We experience how living with other people structures our lives. So the ultimate question then for Al-Farabi was what is the best social structure you can come up with that makes living on earth the best type of life you can have? Um, and to put it more bluntly, you know, according to Al-Farabi and Aristotle, the purpose of human life was happiness, right? Because if you're here and you possess free will, you know, you don't want to live a life that you don't want to live. So the, and his, uh, Al-Farabi's notion of happiness was basically identical to conjunction with the active intellect, which is basically the uh, intellectual condition I described before. Although not everyone pursues this goal. Um, so if the goal of life is happiness and we possess free will and human beings collectively possess free will, then there really is nothing stopping people from living their best possible life at any given point in time. So the fact that there is actually unhappiness in the world is a bit dystopian. It shouldn't exist, given that there's nothing barring us from living the perfect life. So ultimately, you know, Afarabi spends all this time uh, delineating, you know, the notion of the active intellect, the notion of conjunction, and how uh, a society must be hierarchical, primarily because the first cause and the intelligences it produces are also hierarchical. hierarchical. So it's really impossible for hierarchy to not exist. And uh, he spent some, times also, some time also um, uh, criticizing other kinds of regimes, uh, democracy being one of them. Plato also criticized democracy. Um, but uh, he, the, the classes he came up with, I'm going to shortcut here a bit, uh, for the virtuous city, which is his ideal city, identical to Plato's ideal city, um, consists of basically three or four different castes, which appear in multiple different cultures. So to enumerate these four castes, in Hinduism they appear as the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. The Shudras don't always appear in the other formulations of these castes, um, primarily because they're in some sense seen as being beyond the pale of the caste system. Um, but first I'll enumerate at a high level what cultures speak to the caste system. So obviously Hinduism is the one that it's most known for. People often have the mistaken idea that the Hindus um, believe caste was by birth, but according to the Mahabharata and certain Shastras, um, if you want more info, you can see, I'll put a link in the description, uh, Heiko Kreshmer's uh, Sanskrit reader. He provides a lot of citations for uh, castes, uh, the notion that caste is not determined by birth, but actually by disposition or conduct or merit, true merit, right? personal merit. Um, so, so in reality, according to the Hindu tradition, you're a Shudra by birth, meaning you're just at square one by birth. But you ascend to different castes by participating in something called Dvija, which according to the traditionalist school, meaning René Guénon, uh, Frith Joshuan, and Julius Evola, uh, initiation is a supra-individual experience where basically the relative part of you makes contact with something that's absolute. And once this contact is made, it, it's basically identical to what another author, who's not traditionalist, but he's sometimes known among Neo-Advaita um, Neo uh, thinkers, Jed McKenna, he calls this uh, human adulthood, or first step, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, this thing takes you out of, uh, it, 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 the first thing to understand about this is that this development is suprapersonal, so it's not um, an intensification of personal attributes. It doesn't mean that you become more generous or more compassionate or more energetic or you know more efficient efficient at your job or more intelligent. The absence or presence of those attributes says nothing to a person about someone who has undergone this experience because it is super individual. It is not a personal thing. It doesn't exist in the personal domain. It actually exists parallel to it or on another dimension 
literally. So it's actually a genuine initiation. It's actually what's meant by, in Christianity, uh, spiritual regeneration or death rebirth. A lot of Christians claim to be born again, but they're no, they are no such thing. Uh, uh, but anyways, once this actually occurs, you have to do some work yourself to actually cooperate with the process. And that is when you enter the upper three castes in Hinduism, the Vaishya, the Kshatriya, and the Brahmin. And once you attain uh, actual conjunction, I guess, with the active intellect, to use Alkaravi's terminology, or you get to a state where you can verbalize all these ideas, you know, in a non-mystical way, basically, but in a plain common sense way, and you know it the same way you know, you know the back of your hand or other topics, like how to fix a car or how to make a sandwich, that is when you become a Brahmin. Uh, I think it was Julius Evola who actually said that um, metaphysics is to certain rational, uh, esoteric, quote-unquote, topics, but physics is to, you know, the physical world. So, I mean, really, you can, you can know, quote-unquote, all the mysteries of human life in a definitive and common-sense way such that you can describe it and it actually sounds you know, boring, not actually mystical or wonderful or mysterious, and yeah you can uh you can do that that's why mysticism is sometimes seen as opposed to this type of pursuit because mysticism requires that there's a sense of mystery that you don't know things um if you require that you can't really be a knower because once you know the truth of something you know the mystery part disappears um but i should also know that if you were to engage in this process um if you were let me think if you were to engage in this process, it's not really the same as acquiring knowledge, uh, primarily because you can't really know something without your mind taking the shape of what you know. So you cannot know something without you changing as a person, meaning that it's impossible to engage in this process without actually changing fundamentally as a person. And to change fundamentally as a person is to engage in superpersonal transformation, because any kind of change that is not superpersonal is just a variation of what you were before, is just circumstantial. Or to put it another way, it is possible to believe you engage in this type of transformation, but at the same time, given a change in circumstances, all of your so-called progress disappears. This happens a lot with a lot of gurus. Um, there was Kula Dasa recently who, you know, engaged in personal meditation for decades or however, however many years. And it was eventually discovered that he was actually just paying prostitutes behind people's backs to, you know, fulfill whatever personal desires he had. Um, not that I necessarily see a problem with the, that. We don't have to just discuss the ep ethics part of it. But my point is that personal effort, human effort especially, does not really do anything to bring about initiation. And the reason is because initiation is not a human thing. It is superhuman. So the absolute or God, that is the unconditioned, uncreated thing, has to be a factor in a person's initiation. Otherwise, it does not literally come from above. So... To cut a long story short, that is how you would progress up the castes in Hinduism. In the Zoroastrianism, or Iranian culture, the same tripartite division is found. They have priests, warriors, and uh, cattle herders, or uh, yeah, farmers, which is also found in Hinduism. Vaishyas are often uh, associated with agriculture. And then, uh, in, and it appears in different places in Zoroastrianism. So there, are, there were some since Sasanian kings, I think, uh, Ardashir, is also quoted as having divided people into three different castes. Um, the myths of Jamshid, who was the essentially Iranian Noah, responsible for having created a gigantic underground cavern where he stored copies of all living things, just like Noah had the Ark, also divided people into castes, at least according to the myths. Um, it appears actually in Islamic thought. Uh, this, and is, this is Islamic thought that's not associated with any sect. So, you know, there, was, there were Isma uh, Ismaili thinkers and Nashi thinkers who perhaps divided people into castes or at least, you know, had very elitist notions of dividing people into categories. And there were is, uh, Islamic philosophers, just like Al-Farabi or Avicenna. Uh, but there were people neither associated with those two groups who did divide people into castes as well. And these people were kind of associated with, uh, you know, the founders of the Abbasid or the Umayyad caliphates. Uh, you know, early companions of the Prophet, you know, uncles to these people, they are quoted, and you can read more of these quotes in a, a book called Hierarchy and Egalitarianism in Islamic Thought. They are often quoted as uh, basically um, dividing people into castes. So they believed that at the top there were people who knew God objectively and then spent their life contemplating God, aka Brahmins. And then below them there were noble people by birth who governed other people, and then there were uh, 
intelligent, educated people, and then there were the masses, right? So, so Islam also has this idea as well. Obviously, Plato had this idea. He came up with it from first principles when uh, writing the Republic. Uh, you know, the philosopher kings at the top, then the warriors, and then the uh, craftsmen, quote unquote. And then obviously Al Farabi and actual philosophers uh, came up with this idea as well, also from first principles. But the distinction between them and Plato is that they glued this in with a religion. And they had this notion of the prophet, which is distinct from the philosopher ruler, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, lastly, the traditional school, comprising uh, Evola, Genon, and Schwann, also talked about the caste system, and they also paid lip service to it. So really, it's not it's really not a controversial idea. It's actually found in many different places, and it's fairly universal too, because it's real. So that is essentially what the virtuous city is. It is one in which there's a hierarchical established uh, continuity between the first ruler, who is somewhat like the synonym for the first cause, who speaks through his agents, who are few in number, who speak to their agents, who are more in number, and so on and so forth, in a kind of concentric mandala. Um, and this is how goodness is dissipated through the world. So if the world politically does not have this type of organization, you ultimately end up with a world in a state of disarray. And uh, it's a bit of a complicated thing, but ultimately Plato did not like democracy. The reason is because in democracy, um, you will often hear people in general, and it doesn't matter what their political affi affiliation is, you'll often hear people say, most people are dumb. Uh, this is actually a very common opinion. People have this opinion about a lot of people. And it's okay to have this opinion, but if you believe that's the case, you would not want to live in a democracy because you have a lot of essentially dumb people governing everything. And that's not ideal. So for Plato, democracy was ruled by the lowest common denominator because most people are not built to be rulers. They're actually built to be ruled. Um, of course, anyone can change their station if they so wish, but they have to engage in the actual existential development I mentioned earlier. And all knowledge is existential. So any knowledge that is not existential, meaning any knowledge in which the thing you are knowing is not you, or, the th or you are not somehow changing fundamentally to conform to what you know, that does not actually constitute knowledge because it's not eternal. So uh, to cut a long story short, any facts you know are actually not really knowledge. Like if you know your phone number, that doesn't constitute knowledge because if you change your phone service, you won't have the same phone number anymore. It's a fact, it's a physical fact. It can be a, a, veri a verified physical fact, but it doesn't constitute what Plato would call knowledge. Uh, um, neither is justified true belief knowledge. Uh, I think this is a thing that Jed McKenna didn't really understand. I think he was criticizing, you know, Plato too much. But I consider Jed McKenna to be what Buddhism calls um, a pratyeka Buddha, meaning a solitary saint. So he doesn't really have to understand religion or philosophy to criticize it. He can just assume what he wants about it, even if he would be wrong were he to study it more, which he is. Uh, but the character that he created when he criticized Plato, um, you can see where he's coming from, and he is correct about that, actually. But... Um, so, yeah, I forgot, I lost my train of thought. So the question is, um, the virtuous city is one ultimately characterized by a hierarchical possession, uh, possession from few to many, so elite to the masses, and is found both you know, in many different cultures, religions, across many different types of thinkers, um, some associated with some religious or philosophical sects, uh, some with not, none of those things at all. So we can somewhat conclude that it's a universal idea because it's maybe built into reality and maybe real. Um, or it may be just because reality is hierarchical because it does really proceed from the first cause, aka God, such that in order to model after the first cause really is to model sort of after, after an uh, organic unity. So the first thing we have to prove is the, that the world is in a state of disarray, and this becomes a bit complicated. So we do live, I do live in America, at least in the moment. And America is a democracy. According to Al-Farabi, a democracy is actually an ignorant regime, just as it is in Plato's regime, uh, just as it is prior to basically the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, which demolished monarchy and aristocracy. Um, out of a deep suspicion for those things. But uh, that's also why, like, for example, the British have myths of uh, King Arthur or the French have myths of Charlemagne. They believe that these people will come back later, which is just a metaphorical way of saying that monarchy, that is when philosophical rule and true justice coincide with real power returns. Um, and 
that type of rule is the only way the hu the human populace will ever have peace because um, you basically just can't have a bunch of people ruling themselves. That's actually the definition of chaos. So, in uh, you first have to prove that democracy, or actually at, at least the world, is in a certain state of disarray, and it kind of is. Um, uh, the question of democracy is basically discarded by Plato, but Al-Farabi endorses it cautiously by admitting that <clears throat> uh, democracy is essentially an absolute container. So what it does is it allows every spectrum of existing type of disposition, uh, action, and conduct in people, its whole dizzying kind of variety, to exist. So democracy, by definition, is, by definition is multicultural. Its core value is freedom meaning that there can't be any kind of cultural or legal, and those two things are different things, restriction on how people live their life. Um, anyone who wants to be a certain way, think a certain way, and act a certain way must be allowed to live that way in a democracy. And the reason, so the more democratic a democracy becomes, to maybe give a more, more poignant uh, metaphor, is uh, the evil people in the democracy will become even more evil. They'll become better at being evil. And the more the virtuous people in the democracy will become better at being good. They'll become more virtuous. Um, the stupider people will become better at being stupid. They'll become more stupid. So basically, every extreme that could possibly exist in the world essentially becomes its perfect form of democracy. And it becomes this huge package of multidimensional, like all kinds of people exist doing their own thing. And the reason why this might be a good thing, even though in, it, in its actual form it is technically evil, is because it could organically give rise to a bunch of virtuous philosophical thinkers. Because this kind of regime allows people to think how they want uh, to pursue their own interests, it could organically give rise to philosophers who eventually conceive of the virtuous city on their own and then maybe look back through history and then see that this idea is verified and then attempt to establish it. So the democracy as a regime can actually morph into a virtuous city, um, which is interesting. Um, and I think this may not contradict Al-Farabi's thoughts, but I think there can be many, many ignorant regimes within like, you know, across cross sections of humanity and so on and so forth. So to prove that we live in the dystopia, we first have to basically assess like if there is any place in the world to live that's ideal. And the answer is pretty much no. Um, I mean, a lot of people want to live in America, but even in an America, there are many cultural kinds of, um, how you say, uh, cultural unpleasant things that exist. And a lot of these things were predicted by Hinduism, especially in the Puranas, which uh, cover the symptoms of the Kali Yuga. And especially in Islam, especially via Muhammad's, uh, may peace be upon him, um, uh, predictions about the end of the world. So I can't, I can't discuss eschatology too much, but it's not viewed, at least in certain forms of Islam, as a bad thing. It's often viewed as a transition to a perfect eternal age, or to what Hinduism calls the Krita Yuga, or what the Bible calls the New Earth, or what Zoroastrianism calls uh, the Renovation, um, or Frashagird, I think. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. So one, I mean, Islam has probably, uh, has a unique set of symptoms that they predict will presage the end of the world. One of them is the existence of cell phones. Um, they claim that when the world is about to end, people will emerge from their homes and their thigh will speak to them, telling them about, t telling them about what happened to their home while they were away, which just refers to p phones in your pocket. Um, skyscrapers is another one. They say that uh, poor, barefoot, naked shepherds would compete in the construction of tall buildings, and this is true. Three out of the five, three out of the five tallest buildings in the world exist in Dubai. Um, there, there's also a discussion of Syria. There are three different factions that fight over Syria: black flags, ISIS, Khorasan. Um, especially, and the sexual one is the interesting one. Um, and this also ropes in Ibn Arabi, who was Arabi, um, who was. Um, the last master, basically, is a famous Sufi along with uh, Jalal al-Din uh, Rumi. Um, and I kind of don't want to get into that right now, but there is a ultimately d revolving around the idea of contraception um, and the sexual marketplace and mass shootings. You know, you can see a lot of discord in America, especially when you rope in uh, who I think I don't speak Arabic, unfortunately, but who who uh, Muhammad may peace be upon him called the Ruwaybida. Uh, who are essentially a small group of people who are very influential um, socially. So basically to the far left, I think is what he was referring to. Um, 
so all these kinds of discord you know exist um you know loosened uh, social and marital mores give rise to mass shootings and this is abetted by contraception which gives rise to female musicians and this legitimizes the use of alcohol and partying and the pursuit of hedonism um, and this is all against the backdrop of a materialist reductionist uh, view of the world in which uh, only matter exists and you don't exist after death and therefore you can pursue whatever you want all life and all these types of things and this is pretty 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 uh at odds with what people believed in in history people believed in in history pre-modern and pre-modern thought that is prior to the enlightenment the renaissance they didn't believe that the physical world was all that existed they did actually believe there was something beyond it they did believe in the afterlife and they did believe in marital mores and as a result there were no mass shootings and there was no overpopulation and there was no culture war and uh, no you know lgbtq slash feminism versus all the right no, like none of these conflicts existed and uh, young men and women were probably a lot happier back then. Uh, there's also a ban on alcohol, drinking and dancing and drugs and so on and so forth, but all these types of things you know you can do freely now. And there was also less probably wealth disparity. Even if it existed, it was said to exist in the hands of the right people, whereas now, you know, legally you can do whatever you want in a democracy, and that's kind of the rub. So yeah life is not you know perfect anywhere but as what i as i delineated in the first you know 10 minutes of this video there's nothing wrong with life being perfect there should be perfect life there should be a perfect life for everyone um and the reason is because we're human beings we can think rationally and we have free will so there's really no reason to live a life in which not everyone on earth is like 100 percent happy like there's just it doesn't make sense like there's nothing barring us from doing this and another symptom of this is actually work, uh, labor. Um, in, uh, in Hinduism, there's a prediction that during the terminal phase of the Kali Yuga, the entire world will be reduced to one caste, that is the laboring caste. Um, and you can see that it's true now. Uh, there are no true aristocratic people in society because everyone is, is an employee in some function, even the president. So the president is someone who's hired by the people, and then he's later fired by the people, or maybe rehired. Um, they're uh, business owners like CEOs, you know, uh, if their company is public, they're accountable to a board or they're accountable to the people, aka the stock market, which is really just the people. Uh, law enforcement, such as the Kshatriyas, they're all fireable, you know, uh, the FBI director, FBI agents, uh, the CIA, police officers, SWAT, the army, these people are all, all can get fired from their job, they can all get booted. And even intelligent, you know, craftsmen like uh, software engineers, computer scientists, you know, scientists, you know, metaphysicians, they're used uh, to produce money. You know, their, their, their science, you know, their knowledge, which is its own end, really, is used for a, a good. It's used for, you know, an economic good, which is a bit strange. And that doesn't really make sense because, you know, science is immutable. The things that it discovers cannot be changed because they're true. So you can't really manipulate something true to a kind of, kind of end. You can only do that by misunderstanding it, which means that there really can't be, like, worldly scientists like to be a true scientist you have to be a bit ascetic you have to be a bit out of the world um and that, i think that's that's a bit of a strange you know conundrum like uh if the truth exists let's say the only thing you could really do with it that honors it is to just know what it is ultimately and then try to conform your actions to it to conform your life to it but you're not going to try to alter it but the thing with you know software for example or other kinds of science is that you, you try to to stronghold or manhandle these principles into doing what you want and you can't do that it's impossible in this world and in any world because it's always going to be true a true thing is true across space and time otherwise it's not true so you can only do that quote unquote by actually damaging your brain and misunderstanding what you're trying to manhandle and that's exactly what happens in the world so all these kinds of like these kinds of dystopian uh, professions the reduction of the world to one caste the existence of mass shooters um you know, feminism, uh, lack of modest stress for women, especially in the presence of contraception, uh, dating, HIV, AIDS, uh, extramarital sex, hooking up, loosening sexual mores, uh, female musicians, alcohol, political conflict, the Middle East destroying itself, uh, religious fundamentalism pervading the entirety of the third world, uh, China, you know, basically being seduced by a materialistic kind of thought, uh, economically efficient, but, you know, lacking even mentally, uh, America possessing mentality, but pr not possessing supra rationality which is how you can actually know god um although that may not be a problem because ultimately super rationality for al-farabi and the other philosophers was always in all times reserved for only a few people 
But the difference is, is that in a virtuous city, at least other people will know via images and their mentality that some kind of truth does exist somewhere and that they should pursue it. So the goal of the virtuous city is to produce a city that everyone can participate in, in their pursuit of happiness and that everyone in, uh, aids everyone else in this pursuit uh, unconditionally. And this is the ideal city because if you're pursuing something other than happiness, and by happiness I mean the definition I delineated before, that is knowledge of God or cleaving to the eternal thing because, you know, according to the Buddha, for example, uh, happiness cannot be found in impermanent things. Uh, to pursue any goal other than that is ultimately sinful because it destroys both yourself and other people. And my goal in life is to be a prophet founder of this type of city. So to go back to what I was mentioning, maybe around the halfway mark, the prophet is someone who does not appear in Plato because Plato, for Plato, there are only two sides of the coin. There was the philosopher and the ruler. And by conjoining them, you had the perfect city. But the question arises for Al-Farabi, Maimonides, and Avicenna, and if you want to read more about this, you can see Leo Strauss's, uh, the, co the complete, uh, uh, you can see this compendium of Leo Strauss's writings on Maimonides. The prophet is someone who, Maimonides and Al-Farabi, by roping in their religious affiliations to um, Judaism and Islam respectively, was an individual who was able to create the infrastructure for the virtuous city if it did not exist at the time. So for Plato, the ruler of the virtuous city was someone who could govern it provided this tripartite division of people already existed. But if it didn't exist, the prophet for Maimonides and Al-Farabi was someone who created such an infrastructure. So the, the, the question is how you define a prophet. So a prophet, very simply, is not someone who's sent by God. According to Al-Farabi and Maimonides, there is no such thing as the anthropomorphic God that people often think about. Um, the only way God really interacts through the world is via that remote chain of command that he effortlessly participates in. So the world is kind of actually just the thought of God. And uh, the way God, quote unquote, sends a prophet is that there is always going to be someone numerically or statistically speaking throughout in the world um, who possesses the necessary ethical and intellectual requirements to naturally become magnetized by the active intellect. And uh, there are, both in Hinduism and Islam and Neoplatonism, all these three, uh, there's a kind of division of the world into elements. So there is, um, first of all, there's the uncaused first cause, which we'll just call the, call the one. Secondly, there's the intellect, um, which, again, as I have mentioned, is, is essentially a, a principle that's characterized by division of things into two, or just division of things. So distinctness, uh, difference, is the, is the property of the intellect. And... It's called the intellect because you can cognize things by comparing them with each other. And the third one, which is interesting here, and this is the huge rub, and uh, out of all the traditionalists, uh, there's one named William Stoddart, or Stoddart, who is kind of a disciple of, you know, Avola, Schwann, and uh, Guénon. Um, and so he mostly, in my opinion, seems to summarize their works, but uh, he is often very adamant, along with uh, Kumara Swami, I think Ananda Kumara Swami, and Evola, that there is a big difference between the mind, the thinking mind, and the intellect. Those two things are different, and you have to keep that in mind. The thinking mind is concerned with rationality. The intellect is super rational, so it's not the same as cognitive thought. So in Neoplatonism and Plotinus's schema, there's something called the soul, which is basically identical to the thinking mind. And that is, is what uh, the peripatetic philosophers called the imaginative faculty. That is, this faculty is responsible for retaining sense impressions, that is, things you touch, uh, you know, see, um, smell, uh, taste, and hear, and then storing them, recombining them, and then reproducing them. So, you know, uh, if I see some grass and I imagine grass is red, um, maybe because some blood is spilled on it, or I see a woman and then I imagine her being a different ethnicity, this is all the imaginative faculty at work. So you also use this faculty when engaging in, like, arithmetic, like um, if you're adding 2 plus 2, or if you're doing your taxes, or if you're doing any kind of cognitive work, really, even if you're programming, this is all the imaginative faculty. Because all you're doing is rearranging sense impressions and then reproducing them. Even if the principles you work with are eternal, you may not necessarily be aware of them in principle. To be aware of principles in principle that is divested from their circumstances, you must possess the intellect or the acquired intellect, and that's a different thing. So I can, for example, know how to drive a car without necessarily understanding how it works. Um, but I, I guess that's a, not a very good example because understanding how something works at the high level is essentially what an idea is because an idea is a universal it's a universal across circumstances or space and time quote unquote 
So, where did I lost my thought? So the question of who a prophet is is uh, how. Oh, then besides the okay, so let's recap. We have the one. We have the intellect, the soul, aka the imaginative faculty, and then the five senses. So in Neoplatonism, I mean that's pretty much what it is. It's the one or toen, uh, the intellect, which is called uh, nous, the soul, psyche, and then the five senses, which is just nature, right? In Hinduism, this appears too. We have Atma, which is basically uh, the unconditioned principle, or Brahman. I prefer Brahman. Uh, you have Buddhi, which means intell uh, intellect. You have Manas, meaning mind. And then you have the five Indriya, or the senses, uh, which are sometimes called uh, Nyanindriya or Karmendriya, meaning just uh, senses of knowledge, or then and then senses of senses of action. But ultimately, it just means like you know, touch, sense, uh, touch, taste, and so on and so forth. The Buddha had this too, but it was an emanational. He initially just distinguished between nibbana and then the six senses including which the sixth sense was the imaginative faculty or the mind so the question of who a prophet was was a bit interesting according to al-farabi avicenna and maimonides i think all three of them mostly agreed on this but let's just stick to al-farabi and uh, maimonides um, the prophet was someone who in whom the active intellect influenced both his intellect and his imaginative faculty so he a prophet becomes a philosopher by being influenced by the active intellect in his intellect. He becomes a prophet when his imaginative faculty becomes influenced by the active intellect. And this is because a perfected imaginative faculty allows an outflow from his intellect, which contains basically knowledge of universals and, uh, you know, certain types of ideas. This overflows onto his imaginative faculty, which is perfected, and allows him to see pictorial visions, dreams, and encounters with angels who are just personified celestial intelligences, basically, Anthropo anthropomorphized, uh, you know, visions of those types of things. And this is how he can communicate to the people, because according to these philosophers, the, the average person is not capable of understanding transcendent truths. So the way you communicate them is by creating a religion. And a religion is just the translation of intellectual knowledge from an intellect into the imaginative faculty, which is perfected. Because this imaginative faculty can um, come up with images and uh, metaphorical expressions that people can easily understand. And people, by using these kinds of teachings as a raft, as the Buddha would say, can use them as a necessary kind of evil or upaya or um, uh, skillful means to eventually rely, rely acquire objective knowledge which doesn't really need words to convey aka the acquired intellect and then they can discard those expressions so every religion was founded by an individual who had perfected both his his intellect and his uh, imaginative faculty although according to maimonides uh, moses was unique but his Maimonides' opinion of Moses, Moses is really just the opinion of every person who adheres to their religion. Uh, because each religion must view itself as absolute, otherwise it can't really convey the truth and all that kind of stuff. And Frith Schwan really does a good uh, job of delineating how multiple things can appear contradictory but all be true. Um, not on a same level, but at a transcendent source which exists above, quote-unquote, their disunity. Um, but we don't have to discuss that here. So the other question is then, uh, who is a person in whom the active intellect only influences their intellect? And that person is basically a Brahmin or a philosopher. This person can understand the truth objectively, maybe discourse about it with others, but they cannot communicate it to the masses. They're basically Pratyaka Buddhas. They cannot teach it. They can know it, um, but they, you know, they are Brahmins. They cannot form the virtuous society. A virtuous society can be only be formed by someone who is a prophet or an avatar, someone who is both... Uh, uh, philosopher and ruler in one because only such a person possesses the blueprint for creating that society but a brahmin is someone who has a perfected intellect but not a perfected imagination they are able to know the truth and are relatively few compared to the masses but they cannot really communicate it secondly there's someone who the active intellect uh, perfects their imagination or influences it this person according to Maimonides and I love this definition is on the one hand a magician, a soothsayer, or a sorcerer, or a dreamer of veridical dreams, meaning someone who dreams like he has bits and pieces of true events happening elsewhere randomly in a dream, or a politician or a statesman. So this person is a just the politician, a just the statesman, uh, or what Julius Evola calls uh, uh, 
or he didn't call it this exactly, but a profane warrior, essentially. Um, temporal lord is what he called it. Uh, temporal lords of war. These people are Kshatriyas. Uh, they are... The, the true founder of the virtuous city is someone who is both Brahmin and Kshatriya and one. He is a king and a philosopher and one. But he is also a prophet in the sense that he is king, philosopher and one, and someone who creates this society that exists in him, but he brings it out into the world. This infrastructure, this fourfold division didn't exist before. Um, a Kshatriya is someone who is just a legislator. He is a statesman. Um, and I know, I think I know a handful of people who actually are like this. Uh, you know, one of them calls himself magic, you know, because uh, he views himself as a sorcerer or a magician, but he's also, in my opinion, a Kshatriya. Um, you know, there's one Vedanta blog that described uh, Kshatriyas as being people who possessed dynamic energy that's unselfish, and Brahmins as possessing contemplative energy, um, and then Vaishyas as possessing uh, uh, dynamic energy that is selfish, and then Shudras as just possessing uh, lethargic energy, or that is, you can only derive value from them by submitting them to labor. But the whole point of caste system is not to oppress people, but basically to encourage people to in, to engage in the goal of uh, attaining happiness, which is really just conjunction with the active intellect. So by esteeming Brahmins, you basically convince Shudras to stop pursuing other goals, which would, uh, you know, eventually bring them shame and uh, uh, convince them that uh, happiness really is in their best uh, interest, which is knowledge of God. So that's really what the caste system is. It's basically just a giant funnel up to God because God creates everything, so everything must return to God. And the project of the virtuous city is to create a kind of triangular py pyramidical uh, structure in which the masses at the bottom eventually get funneled up a series of steps up to their true destiny, which is the deity. And um, that is where I'll stop today.